Every year for the, the Crown Point Road Association, we, we did somehow manage to work all our events in, and surprisingly, they were all pretty well attended, um, you know, despite the coronavirus, which is all our, our concern. Uh, and because of that, obviously, we're not having a potluck today. Uh, and then all the ideal weather on all our events, I don't think we worried about any rain at all, period. Um, every day, the day went pretty well. Um, one of the next things I always talk about is I like to acknowledge some of the deaths that have occurred in the past year. And there's only one that I'm aware of, and I know he was a member of the association a brief time, but myself and Al Ransom did quite an extensive work with him uh, back in the 90s. Uh, he kind of headed up this... Uh, what he called the GAP project, the, the German Auxiliary Project in the uh, Sharm and Orwell area, and basically looking to see where the, the German troops landed on the Vermont side and how they got down to the southern end of Mount Independence to cut off the American retreat. Uh, his name was, was Ronald Kingsley, and he lived in Schenectady, New York, and he was very interested in the Crown Point Road uh, the Thai branch in particular, um, and him and I worked together, it's mostly with Ron's effort, we put an article together for the Vermont Archaeological Society Journal uh, back about 2000, and there's a lot of great information in there that uh, was found. And if you ever have a chance to go online, I believe all of his material is in the library in Albany, New York. Um, there's, I'm not even gonna guess how many boxes of material of his research, but it's huge. It's just endless. And um, so he's quite a, quite a character. And I, I just saw him two years ago in, at his home in Schenectady, and he was doing pretty well at that time. Um, but I don't know, is there any other deaths that we should, uh, Acknowledge at least any of our. There's none that I can think of. So as I said, um, <clears throat> just want to reflect back uh, about our hikes this past year. Of course, in May we were at the Hubbard and Battlefield with Tom Hughes as the leader. We had a great day. I think there was ten or so of us there that day. Uh, for our June outing, Skylerville, we had to cancel that. <clears throat> And I'll say, yesterday I drove down to Skylerville to the surrender site. It was the anniversary of the, the surrender on October 17th. Um, just wanted to be there. I'd been there a year before when they had the grand opening of the new interpretive site there. And uh, it's pretty good if anybody ever gets a chance to do that. And who knows, uh, maybe for 2021 we can try to work it into our program for next year. But see. We canceled it because of the coronavirus. Uh, getting into New York State at that time was going to be an issue. <clears throat> As for July, <clears throat> there was again the Tavern Homestead and other points of interest on the Crown Point Road tour. Um, Barry Griffith and Dennis Deverell ended up leading it. I wasn't able to be there that day, but I heard that it was well attended and a lot of interesting things to look at. Then. Uh, in August, Joe Pasquarello did the, uh, the hike there from, oh, I can't remember the marker number, Joe, 32 or so, over to the Kingdom Cemetery. It was a, another interesting day. Uh, in September, I led the hike around Hardigan Hill in Orwell and Shore, I'm looking at the Thai branch. And that brings us up today um, for our annual meeting here in, um, Pittsburgh, Dale. The outing in June was canceled, but we did have a makeup oh. at Addison County that you led. Yeah. It's worthy of mention because it was really good. I skipped over that part here somehow. Yeah, I kind of organized the Southern Addison County tour, kind of focused on Ann's story and the Green Mountain Boys. Um, a lot of interesting points there that day. Uh, I don't know, Secretary's Report, Dale, if we yes. have something. Does anybody need a copy of this? I think got one. It's a similar format to last year. It's, it has 
kind of a, gl a glimpse of all, all our numbers. I'll just start from the top and go down through. Uh, the number of active paid memberships right now is 101, which is slightly up from the last couple of years. It's kind of holding steady. Um, I believe that does not include complementary memberships that we send to certain organizations. So that's fairly active and healthy, I would say. Uh, recipients of emails, that actually has grown well. Um, those are not all members. Anybody that wants to get on the email mail list, mailing list, I've been adding. It doesn't cost us any money, and about once a month I try to send out an email with some uh, information and uh, update on things that are going on with the organization. And social media has gotten fairly active. Um, the Crown Point page has, I mean, in fact, today we had a, a good number of participants talking on one of the posts, so it, it's fairly active. It's really good. Um, that number has grown really well the last couple of years. Um, Hubbardton, there's a there's a, another Facebook page for the Hubbardton Military Road. That number has done well too. That really has not been promoted well or active. Um, that's kind of on my shoulders. Uh, I'd like to try to do more posts next year. Um, and for membership breakdown, is very similar to the year before. Uh, we've got very good numbers for the contributing and sustaining memberships. Um, very, very generous people in the organization. Um, there, the single membership for a single person is still a great bargain of only $5. And, but despite that, a lot of people donate extra. Uh, the average membership shown below is about $13. That reflects a lot of generous people. Um, so that that shows that our, our money and our assets are fairly stable. Um, the treasurer will get into that detail, but uh, we're we're doing quite well with memberships and keeping our expenses in check. Um, the I guess that's all I have to say on the secretary report, unless there's any questions. There will be. Um, a video today. Um, it'll be put on YouTube eventually. I'll continue with emails and at some point in the spring there'll be another mailing um, as we have in the past with outing schedules and other information. But we will, despite the ongoing situation, we will continue to be uh, in communication with all the members and, and uh, doing what we can to, to keep busy and, and continuing our research projects and other long-term projects that we have been wanting to complete and actively working on. Uh, Mr. President, any questions? Um, I like that lifetime membership one, 6%. Yes, yes, it doesn't bring in much reoccurring money, but uh, <laughs> it's, um, it's been good. Mm -hmm. I think we had uh, one or two again this year it is, you know, a good bargain, I think, and gives gives our coffers a good little boost. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned the email, and uh, if if anybody has an email that could share with us, it would make it easier if uh, we had to shift gears and we could at least notify people. Um, you know, if there should be a change or so, if you should be aware of something. I mean. The, be great if we could encourage more people to give us their, their emails. Yes, like in the past, we often got phone numbers from people, and I was never involved, sent, you know, calling people. But that was kind of the traditional means of contact when you needed it. And email has kind of taken that place because it's fast, and as long as people, um, you know, respond and look at email occasionally. So yeah, email is preferred if we can have that sense of con that source of contact for people. Dale, um, treasurer. Um, sorry if you can't hear me. I can speak up. That's not happening. <laughs> so, um, did anybody get a copy of this this one? Does that need some? Okay. Um, basically, we had an income of about twenty two eighty six and expenses of fourteen sixty nine. Um, coffers went up about six hundred and change. 
pretty much all I have. <laughs> this is actually the highest we've been since I've been a treasurer here. Um, but that's mainly because we didn't have any bus trips this time or anything like that, which tends to kind of either break even or, or drop us a bit. So I guess we're doing well. <laughs> I'd say we did pretty well. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't do anything, really. <laughs> Great. It might be some my test. So we were talking a little bit early about the number of books. and all. What was that number you had, Dale? It was a couple hundred left. 160. At the, it could be a little more than that. I, I have a few, 20 or so, maybe, at my place. Yep. And that's something we're going to be working on in the next few years. It'd be nice to update that book with some great pictures and uh, but some newer pictures. And uh, you know, maybe another map or two in there would be great. I, I think a lot of the corrections had been done. I remember going through... There was a bunch of us that did it a few years ago, a few, like 10, 15 years ago now. Um, and there was some, some other little thing I saw that I thought should be adjusted for, we haven't did another book. So if anybody's ever going through the book and they see something they think that might need a little correction, you should let us know. And this last edition's got all the GPS uh, locations for the markers, which is great. And then if we should add another marker in the next year or two, we certainly have to include that. Okay. Um, the next thing we usually do here is the committee reports. Uh, one thing that's going to come up soon is, is a historian. I mean, you all remember Elaine Purdy has been our past historian, and, and she turned that down last year. So we're going to have to work on that. I'm sure it's going to come up with our next uh, director's meeting here pretty soon. Uh, markers, uh, books, research mapping, and hospitality were the committees of the Crown Point Road Association. So <clears throat> on the markers, I, uh, anybody know of any that are uh, in need of straightening up or no fixing or anything like that. I know there's a few up in the Shoreham area that probably should be looked at. And Dennis, you mentioned that one down in Hampstead there behind the guardrail. The one Maybe, yeah, a year ago, that one, other one in Weathersfield there uh, got straightened up. So they did a good job. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> it was the town road crew. Very. Yeah. Yeah. Sometime, this is as good a time as any talking about markers. Uh, yeah, story. Hey, Marker, you want to tell a little story about that? About which one now? And story, hey, Marker. Oh, the Kale Markers in front of you and the rest of the group. Yeah, well, I guess that, that's quite a story, and it's, it's probably a relatively short story, but <clears throat> Mr. Powers here back uh, in the spring there was mentioning about going up and, and finding it, and there's several of us that have always been interested in that marker. And Bill and, and some of his family went up in the spring and, and found it, and a nice picture in the Addison Eagle about it. Um, we realized that it needed to be trimmed up around it. So back uh, I don't know, a month or so ago, um, Barry and Barb and Rebecca and I took a day and we put some bolts in the water and we rode up to the marker. I can't remember if it's a mile and a half north of the that covered bridge was, it seems thereabouts. Um, anyway, we trimmed up all around it, we cut some brush, and it's easily visible from Otter Creek now. <clears throat> the unfortunate thing with that marker is you cannot walk to it. Uh, well, you could, but it's pretty tough going. Easiest way, certainly, by water. But you all know the story of the end story's cave, I would, would guess, about how she hid out there at night what not. But it was placed there in 1914, Bill? That's, um, yeah. And it's still, for, not, for having nothing done to it, it's still standing there pretty straight today. The base is starting to get a little bit undermined, so, and I think the, uh, the embankment of Otter Creek's getting a little bit closer to it all the time, too, so it'll stay there a while yet. Um, as far as markers, the water and trough in center Rutland, uh, while it's still in the location it's been in since 1959, it's getting more and more definite all the time that that's probably going to get moved into a new park 
that Rutland Town is uh, proposing to do uh, to help kind of interpret the whole area there. And we've been involved in that a little bit. Um, the only other thing with the flags on the markers, we should make sure we get those picked up uh, for snow flies. We talked about the books a little bit. Um, I don't really have much to say about researching and mapping and hospitality. Obviously, we've got a great place today to have our annual meeting. Uh, well, the Mountain Independence Hubbard and Military Road is another one of our committees. Uh, this past year, I did the annual car tour on the Highville branch and probably going to continue again in 2021. Uh, it'll be from the Mountain Independence to the battlefield. Uh, Rebecca Hauer and I have explored pretty extensively the area from Glen Lake to East Road and Benson. Uh, we've located a number of cellar holes and there's at least two yellow signs with the black letters that are actually in the woods there that have been located. So hopefully, maybe not this coming year, but I'd like to see about doing a hike from Glen Lake up to East Road to Benson. It'd be a, a great hike, I think. And I've had uh, at least two phone calls, uh, one recently and one a couple months ago, people asking about the road. So it's pretty interesting about the, the interest on it. Do you have anything you want to add about the military road, the public branch, particularly Tom? Or? No, I'd, I'd like to add something a little about our secretary. Yeah. Mail puts out in the spring the most amazing mailing <laughs> with the, the magnet and all the information you can need. It's extremely well done. And um, on top of that, um, he's got a great sense of humor. Yes. <laughs> and the secretary of defense is here on a collector's edition of the State of the Union. Yeah. Oh, oh Dale and Wendy do it. Job back home in the association. Uh, Let's right for Saturday Night Live. <laughs> Glasses are fogging up on here. Uh, but I guess that's all we've got on the committees. Uh, we'll move right to old business, and I really don't have too much here either. Uh, certainly, always looking for volunteers. For these committees, I, I think I say it every year, and if anybody has any ideas for hikes, we're always going to use a, a hike you know, to add to the ones that are already doing it. Yeah, Dale. Related to committee projects, um, you should mention the, the interpretive sign project and how it's began. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've been talking about doing an interpretive sign at both Crown Point and Ford at number four. Um, I'm hopeful to get a number of us together here before snow flies to talk about that a little bit more. We thought there'd be two identical signs, one in each place, uh, just to talk about the Crown Point Road and the, the importance of it. Um, so So I don't, is there any other old business that we should discuss? Couldn't think of anything else. You know, like I said, we've got the ongoing thing about you know, making sure the markers don't fall over. Um, the interpretive sign, you know, that's something in the works. And it's been a hard year to set up a time to get everybody together that would be involved with that. You can imagine. We've already talked about Facebook. We've got the websites up and going. So if there's no other old business, is there any new business that we should discuss? Yeah. We also have a number of people for metal detecting lined up and ready, and yeah. we need to organize a project. But yeah, we we did get a good response from last year mailing for that. Yeah. So that'll be another project. We gotta mm -hmm. identify some places and just. See if we can't pin this rope down someplace. Mm -hmm. 
right, well, uh, no other new yeah, deal. Speaking of markers, uh, one of our conversations we had before the meeting was about a future marker. And with so many Pittsburgh Historical Society members here, uh, is there a place in Pittsburgh maybe we could um, work with them on to place uh, or some kind of other future project that we can work to, and collaborate together on? Seems yeah. like they have such a, a good historical society. I you know, thought it would be great to maybe on this side of Loop 7 some place if it could be set up to acknowledge the road coming up to Pitts Ford. I mean, at the Hammond Covered Bridge, there's the, the Humphreys marker that mentions uh, Pitts Ford to be in a third of a mile or so to the south. What about at the site where Fort Vengeance was? Would it be appropriate to have a marker there? I wouldn't say for the Crown Point Road. Right. You know, I, I would, and we've got one going down Depot Street here by Keith's, um, which yep. is half sunken in the ground. <laughs> Speaking of projects, yes. Um, well, that would be a good thing to talk about. We can talk to the president of the District Historical Society. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if we have a good spot there to put it, maybe it just needs to be pulled out and put back down. I think there's not much more than a foot of it sticking above No, the you can just barely read it, yeah. What, what would we do with it, Bill? What would you suggest? Well, you could shave that off and we'll put it on the other side of the river where it belongs. <laughs> but that's... Yeah. yeah. I guess that's one thing with these markers, you know, how how and why some of them got placed where they did, you know, it's... I don't think there was ever any real documentation. Well, I'll back up. We have asked the DAR before for documentation, and supposedly none of it exists as to why the markers got placed where they did. I, I know some of the uh, Hubbardton Road ones in Orwell, um, there were some committee members up there that basically they just said, well, Grandpa told me the road went there, and that's why the marker got put there. And, and a good share of the markers got placed where they did, probably for that very reason. Not a whole lot of research went into placing them. But on the other hand, I think Al Ransom probably said it best that uh, the Crown Point Road didn't run in necessarily a fixed location. It would have wandered a little bit from season to season and even year to year. And you take the, the history of it from you know, starting in 1759 up until the early settlement of Vermont, and the, just the direction the road ran, which most of our roads are north, south, or east, or west, and just that, that diagonal angle across the state wasn't 100% sufficient for road. But, so, Crown Point Road obviously moved around quite a bit. Can we move a DAR marker? Yeah, it's been done before. I know of one in Brandon that got simply moved from one side of the road to the other. Like the one on Depot Hill Road, if we did move it across the creek, I mean, maybe I'm thinking at the post office. That'd be somewhat safe and it'd be a parking area. The post office being over on Florence Road. Yes. Right? But if, if we're allowed to move it without the DAR, that would be a project we could take on. <clears throat> yeah, my gut feeling, I mean, the DAR certainly doesn't claim them, the markers. You know, the Crown Point Road Association's been caring for them since. 50s. Um, something we could talk about. Yeah. Very good. It would probably be good form to get hold of the DAR and read yeah. that. I'm sure it would Yeah. The, uh, the watering trough in Center Rutland, it got moved from its original location when it was set in, I don't know if that was 1903 or 9, but 1959 when they did the road construction there, that got moved to where it is now. And that's talking about getting moved again. So, uh, so yeah, who knows? <clears throat> I know some of the banner markers have got an arrow on top of them that kind of indicate the direction of the road went. So I can't think of anything else uh, we need to talk about. Well, if there's no other new business, um, 
guess we go to the uh, election to the slate of officers. And uh, this year, uh, the president, Barry Griffith, is going to take over. Uh, Dennis Devereaux is going to take Barry's place as vice president and become the vice president. And <clears throat> I didn't ask either one of them, but I'm sure they're willing to do it again. Uh, Dale will, will continue as the secretary, and Whitney will continue as the treasurer. Any no objections? Uh, and our directors are going to be, will be Tom Hughes. His term was up this year, and he graciously accepted to do another three years. And Larry Clark uh, until 2022, and Joe Pasquarello until next year, 2021. And our, our historian slot is open. Hopefully we can uh, have somebody step forward and, and be willing to take that position uh, soon. Uh, be great to have somebody step in and be willing to kind of collect the any crown point info that comes up and be able to answer some questions to different people that there's always somebody asking about the role. So I nominate you, Jim. <laughs> Dennis. That was my question. Uh, did the board decide or can we fill it today with a nomination? I don't swear we can fill it today. So I would second his nomination. Oh, you know, to thank you. Well, I would uh, graciously accept to that. You, uh, historian, if you're willing to take yeah. it. I can certainly talk Crown Point Road to most anybody. <laughs> yeah, I could be the contact for that. I'm certainly happy to do that. Um, so that's the slate of officers for this year, 2020. For all those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, obviously, nay, and I don't think there's any nays. So, thank you all. Um, ready, Bill?